Welcome into 49ers Access. My name is Sterling Bennett, and yes, you read the title right. We have finally gotten to my rookie minicamp takeaways. We'll dive into Ricky Pearsall. What did Isaac Garendo look like? What about Nick Sorensen in his first press conference? Did I like? What did I not like? What is his relationship with Brandon Staley? And much, much more. So stay tuned for that. Want to ask you to kindly hit that like button, share, and subscribe. And if you're listening on the audio platforms, leave a review. But before we dive into rookie minicamp that happened last Friday, I want to apologize for the backdrop of the podcast on YouTube, Facebook, or X. I'm currently in the midst of moving, and if things sound more hollow, it's because my room is practically empty. I am moving from the Bay to Southern California this weekend, so again, it might be a little bare bones and dry, but again, thank you for joining the show, and let's dive into the news that happened this morning before we get to my rookie minicamp takeaways. We have learned, with the NFL schedule release happening tomorrow at 5 p.m., that the San Francisco 49ers will kick off the 2024 regular season by hosting the New York Jets on ESPN's Monday Night Football. It'll be Shanahan vs. Sala, Purdy vs. Rodgers, under the bright lights of Levi Stadium, week one of the NFL season. I couldn't think of a better way to kick off things for the San Francisco 49ers, other than having Aaron Rodgers come back to Levi Stadium, where I believe he's 0-4 in the playoffs. So a really, really fun matchup week one. Uh, Rodgers recovering from the Achilles injury last year. He suffered week one, so a one-year anniversary for him. Gets to come back and play the team that's haunted him the most. That is the San Francisco 49ers. I uh, want to say what's up to Bobo in the chat. What's going on, Bobo? If you have any questions, leave them in the chat. I promise I will get to them when it comes to the rookies. Uh, San Francisco also did sign two players in the past two days. The first one this morning was offensive tackle Chris Hubbard. Now, Hubbard's 33 years old. He's a veteran player. I think he's going into his 11th year in the NFL. He's 6'4", almost 300 pounds at 295. He's a swing tackle. Uh, If you've known me the past two seasons, and I'm sure like yourself as well, I've said San Francisco needs to improve the swing tackle position, and I was someone who believed that, whether it was via the draft or in free agency, they should have leaned into signing somebody, and of course, you get one week into you know the offseason program, and they have signed another swing tackle. Now they're going to go into the year with, I believe, Trent Williams, Colt McKivitz, Brandon Parker, Jalen Moore, and now Chris Hubbard, and... I, I I wrote an article that was yet to be released that said this team needed to sign a offensive tackle, and they do yesterday, or this morning, excuse me. Uh, Hubbard last year for Tennessee, 10 games played, a 69 straight across the board PFF grade, uh, 18 pressures and four sacks allowed. Now, he's much better in pass protection than he is a run defender, but certainly an intriguing bench option in case McKivitz or Trent Williams happen to go down, and a Pretty interesting, you know, OTA and training camp body that could fight for a depth position on the roster. Uh, But it didn't stop there for San Francisco because, and this gets us into our rookie minicamp takeaways, right? Let's dive into, I guess, in a way, rookie camp last Friday. San Francisco had 23 invited players to try out for that team, whether they be UDFAs, whether they're you know, veterans that don't have a spot in the roster somewhere. I think Jabril Cox tried out last week on Friday. He didn't make the team, obviously, but San Francisco did sign defensive lineman Shaquille Brown, who was at Troy two years ago. Uh, He spent last season on IR with Tennessee, so the Niners signed two former Titans in the last two days. But he tried out on Friday during minicamp and played good enough for looked well enough to make the team or at least sign to the 90-man roster. He also has ties to San Francisco being a top 30 visit two years ago in 2023 prior to the draft. So San Francisco was like Shaquille Brown for the last two years and finally get him in the building for them. And he's now healthy enough to make the roster. Um, I think you look at how this team wants to build trenches out, right? Go sign an offensive lineman. Go sign an interior defensive lineman, a place where 
the, this roster kind of didn't have a lot of depth at it. And I think it makes a lot of sense to improve those two positions. Want to say what's up to Off Hamster Wheel in the comments. And also Niner Gang 209 says, what's up, Sterling? Hope all was well. All was well, Niner Gang. I am moving, though, so uh, the content might slow down a little bit, but we're trying to get things out for you in the midst of the move. But the Shaquille Brown signing brings us to day one, Niners rookie camp last Friday. And I was there. I saw training camp, or I guess I saw, I saw practice. I was in a Nick Sorensen meeting. I saw Jacob Cowing talk, uh, Dominic Pooney and Tatum Bethune all talk to the media. I was there. And I think the biggest takeaways, at least in regards to press conferences, came from Nick Sorensen. When you go from Demeco Ryans to Steve Wilkes, who then gets fired, to Nick Sorensen, a lot of people were asking, how is he going to fit in? Is he, is he going to, to, to pass the vibe check, right? And I think there was a handful of comments he made that instantly felt like a, a reversion back to the Sala, Demeco Ryan style of football. Uh, and I think one of the main quotes I took away was, Nick Sorensen, when asked how he wants his defense to play, he said he wants them to play with speed, violence, and finish in 2024. And he even mentioned the old Demeco Ryan's motto of swarm. So, uh, yes, there is a reversion back to the old scheme when it was Sala and Demeco Ryan's, but there also is kind of a carryover effect of we're not just taking over the scheme. We're taking over the mindset of speed, violence, finish, and swarm. And I think listening to his exact quote on the question was, we've got some young guys in the mix with some veteran guys we're really excited about. As far as changing things, we're going to be aggressive and do what we do, be an attacking defense. Um, I think Steve Wilkes last year, he kind of didn't know when to, to, to pick his spots. Sometimes he was overly aggressive in the wrong areas mainly against Minnesota, and more importantly against Kansas City in the Super Bowl, uh, I think we are going to see not a, you know, a kind of a laid-back defense, obviously not, but more of a a defense that knows when to pick their punches, that aligns with what Kyle Shanahan's used to under the Solos and Demeco Ryan's uh, defensive coordinators that were here in previous years. So we don't know exactly how Nick Sorensen will do, with San Francisco, but just off one press conference, you can tell the vibes have gone from this kind of older, stoic, you know, wisdom, professor-style teacher that was Steve Wilkes to this loud, speed, violence, finish, swarm a mentality that Nick Sorensen has where, you know, he even said that he's going to be on the sideline this year where Steve Volks was yanked out of the booth and said, you got to get your you-know-what on this sideline because I'm tired of you sitting up there with no connection to this team. So Sorensen is definitely bringing back many of uh, the familiarity that Sala and Demeco Ryans had um, the past few seasons prior to Steve Wilkes. Sorensen also said that Talanoa Hufunga was on the field last Thursday getting work done as they build him back from the torn ACL he suffered in November against the Bucks last year. Uh, Sorensen said that he was really good at communicating. He's a smart player, and he fully understands the system. When he gets back, we're going to be excited. And uh, he, you know, he was out there the other day, and he was getting Nick Sorensen excited, which kind of brings us into what they can do with the Malik Mustafas, Renardo Greens, now in the building as rookies. Right, we all know the player who Funga is, and we've talked about this off season of, you know, is he going to be here in the long term? And obviously, time will tell with that. Um, I'm someone that believes Malik Mustafa was not just drafted to be a great player, but also in the chance he has to replace Talanoa Hufunga once his contract's up after this season. Uh, that said, you can tell there is this wonder, this excitement of if we can get Jaya Brown and Mustafa and Ufunga on the field together in three safety sets, like we're going to have three playmakers, three really good, you know, violent, speedy and finishing uh, style of safeties on the field altogether. 
Now, I don't think Hufunga is going to be healthy to start the year. Um, ACL in November, so what's it been? It's, it's, it's almost been a year, so what is that? December, January, February, March, April, May. It's been about six months. Um, there's a chance he's ready for week one, but we all know ACLs are tricky. Everybody reacts differently. Modern medicine is great. He can have an amazing season for sure, but everyone's knees and ligaments and muscles react differently, and it's going to be hard for him to be, to be the exact same player he was uh, a year and a half ago pre-injury, but... I do think that if they can get him back fully healthy, acclimated back to playing football, even if it is in November or December for a playoff run, then you got yourself a really good safety back in the fray for you. And I think it's really exciting to see that even if it is a one year, three safety set, kind of, you know, what's put the puzzle pieces together for a year, that still is really intriguing, really exciting for what it could look like uh, on the red and gold and on the, on the football field for the defense. Um, but that takes us to the rookies. Malik Mustafa. Um, I'll, I will tell you this. Um, I am someone who did gush about Malik Mustafa. I, I, I give it an A-plus draft, or at least that pick an A-plus. And I am someone who has told you, if you listen to previous shows and previous podcasts, that you know I am in love with him as a player. I think he'll be awesome. I think he can be a better player than Talon Noah Hufunga. Uh, and that's just watching tape... From afar, he was at Wake Forest last year in college. So um, I just think that getting to see him in person <laughs> was an entirely different story for myself, not in regards to his projection, his upside. But this man is freaking huge. <laughs> like on tape, if someone is 6'9", like Mason Pline, who neither are getting 209 mentions, Former basketball player, you know, big upside, he's 6'8", he's massive, he's 6'7", you can see the height and just the stature this guy brings. Malik Mustafa is, you know, he's not a big guy, he's not tall, but he's hulking, he's jacked, he's chiseled, and you're like, holy crap, like, I don't want to get hit by that guy. And I think that, you know, seeing him in person, really good communicator. We'll dive into what actually transpired during practice later on in the show, but, you know, really good communicator already. Now, he is a fourth-round pick amongst UDFAs and other picks later than him, but he was pointing out things in practices and, you know, in, in the very short time they had in media sessions, but, you know, already was looking to establish himself as a leader in one day that we saw. Now, how much can you take from that? Who knows? But... Uh, again, Malik Mustafa, stature-wise, was like, this guy's huge, holy crap, and also on the field, pointing out things, speaking, communicating, kind of like Hufunga was doing early on in his career, which gave San Francisco hope he could become something, and also, you know, as a young player in any job, whether it's radio, working at Walmart, jobs want to see you assert yourself as a leader, and when you do that, you get promoted, you get employee of the month, or in the NFL, they say, hey, let's try to get that guy on the field more. He's earned more reps. You can see Malik Mustafa kind of, I don't want to say already earning that because it's so early in, in obviously the offseason program, but you can tell there are inklings of, there, there's building blocks towards something in him as a leader, which is really cool to see. Um, and I think, you know, they talked about being Nick Sorensen, talked about Mustafa's flexibility, his versatility, and said that offenses look to expose you in certain ways, so we love Mustafa's versatility, but also his play style. Even with Green and Tatum Bethune, it's how they play. They fit how we want to play football. And you go back to his quotes of speed, violence, and finish, and you watch Mustafa, his, you know, his 4 or 5, 20 mile an hour speed, finishing with the best run uh, run defending and, 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 and tackling he has in his entire college career last year, you can see that, okay, they took these three words or these three building blocks from a player and said, Green fits it, Bethune fits it, and so does Mustafa. And you can see those things kind of come to life on film and on tape when you watch them when they were in college. And so uh, for the very you know short time we saw Mustafa on the field, impressed in one day which is really cool to see uh renardo green um he and this is really important here because i think a lot of the conversations around him including our deep dive into renardo green their second round pick this season was sure 
Could he be an eventual replacement for Mooney Ward in one year? Maybe. Is it likely? Who knows? Many similarities in their game, but the bigger conversation was, is he going to play inside or is he going to play outside? And Nick Sorensen answered that question in regards to he will start playing Nickelback uh, early in the offseason to learn that position to kind of get his feet wet in case they need him to play that at a certain time this year. Then he'll go and take reps outside, which is where he played in college. So uh, you can tell they want Green to learn during the early parts of the offseason program uh, because Nick Sorensen also mentioned, and I think this may have been an issue last year, where the scheme wasn't too different last season. Obviously, the defense had their ebbs and flows, but um, you can tell with some of the younger players that didn't have an impact last season that uh, under Steve Wilkes that Nick Sorensen said, we don't want to shock these players and put them behind instantly, hence why Green is learning to play nickel back in the NFL early on in the offseason program. So come OTAs later this month, come training camp, come preseason, come regular season, he's not like, I've never played this before, and is like, what's going on, you know? So I think it's really smart. Get his feet wet now. In the case you want to mix and match with Lenore and Yadam on the inside and the outside. It also allows San Francisco to keep Lenore on the inside if necessary, which drives that contract price down a little bit. Um, I think it would behoove San Francisco to try to keep Lenore on the inside. He's a smaller cornerback. He's feisty, had a really great season last year and put two good seasons back to back uh, on, on tape and on film. Um, Eric Soli says this in the comments in the chat. Uh, I think Demo is very underrated. ESPN agrees with you too, and so does PFF. I, I think Lenore got PFF's like most underrated, or maybe it was ESPN's most underrated player on the Niners. I would agree. I think he isn't a big name yet, but what he does, he's dirty, he's grimy, he wants to get his hands filthy, he tackles well, he's a good coverage player, and it pays in a division that has Cooper Cup, JSN, Lockett. The Cardinals are building their offense up that you want to have someone like Lenore playing on the inside for you. And I think not just for contract purposes, because if he plays there, he's cheaper once his contract's up, but also I, I, I believe their best defense, whether it's this year, next year, and four or five years, if they can keep the secondary intact, is Mooney Ward on the outside, Green on the other outside, and Lenore playing on the inside, because that gives you the best chance to win with the experience those guys have, their fit and play style. Uh, and I think that it just makes the most sense in the world. Like, I have a hard time believing they want Green playing inside at all this year. It's just in case, because we don't have anybody else. <laughs> in case Lenore goes down, we can move you inside, put Gatem on the outside, Luter can play outside. Uh, I know that Sorensen mentioned Womack, but again, he didn't take any reps on the inside last year during OTAs and minicamp, so we'll see what transpires this year for him. But Womack's kind of on the out, so if he has to go back inside to kind of keep his spot on the roster, that's fine with me, obviously, but um, there is some maneuvering and versatility with Green that could not just allow San Francisco to mix and match, but also could keep a contract price down a little bit, which they've not been afraid to do in previous years with their uh, expiring contract players, so I wouldn't be surprised if Lenore is a victim of that again this year. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price. Priceline. Uh, that brings us to Brandon Staley's role. Uh, I was someone that during the offseason, pre-free agency, because San Francisco plays into the Super Bowl, fires Wilkes the next week, I believe. Maybe it was two weeks after that. Then, boom, it was free agency. And it was like, okay, who is our defensive coordinator? Obviously, they signed Nick Sorensen. 
but I was someone that believed Brandon Staley was going to be in that role this year. Now, they hired Staley as kind of an assistant head coach and kind of an assistant to Sorensen to help him acclimate to that role as a defensive coordinator, but um, we did learn kind of what Staley's role has been. Um, some people got part of the quote, but didn't get the whole quote. I think it's really important in regards to how they're going to utilize the secondary this year. Um, Nick Sorensen said that, yes, Staley has been involved with pretty much everything on the defense, but he did also explain that Staley has been more connected to the defensive backs and the nickelbacks, which leads me to believe, okay, we're going to get that star position that Staley utilized with the Chargers, a.k.a. Derwin James, uh, where he played a lot towards the line. He'd be kind of this quasi-edge rusher. He wouldn't be in coverage too much downfield. Hence why getting a player like Malik Mustafa, who played the Panther position at Wake Forest, and once you get Ufunga back, can allow you to play these three safety sets. The issue with the Chargers, they didn't have three good safeties, let alone two of them. You bring Mustafa into San Francisco... You have Jair Brown back there who, although was coming into year two, pretty much established himself as a starting caliber safety, although is still young. You have Ufunga off the ACL, hopefully healthier later this year, and you have Mustafa that can play that Panther. Or if all things go well, Ufunga plays up knowing Mustafa's pretty good in coverage and better than Ufunga was in coverage in college. So uh, I think knowing that tidbit tells us what San Francisco is going to want to do. Um, now, I don't buy into this, but I do think that there is, I don't want to say there isn't validity, but I do think there is a reason as to why San Francisco did at least, or, or, or was connected to Jamal Adams, because Jamal Adams can play that Panther position for you, where he's not in coverage too much, he's not going to be this roaming safety up top, he'll play at the line, be a good tackler, and essentially be a linebacker for you, albeit playing safety, so, um, now, don't sign Jamal Adams, please, but I can see as to why they were connected to him uh, a couple weeks ago uh, via Bob Condotta from the Seattle Times. But I do think that that tidbit there, yes, Staley's involved in everything, but defensive backs and Nichols more specifically gives us some insight into what uh, they want to do with the secondary this year. Okay. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, actually, sorry here. One more tidbit on Staley. We don't know where he's going to be on game day. He could be in the booth. He could be on the field. Um, I am someone who I think it would benefit him to be in the booth to see things up top. Uh, I also think there could be a clashing of, you know, who's actually defensive coordinator on the team. Uh, now, I have no idea how exact, you know, how those meetings go. Nobody's privy to that, but um, I think it would be best if Staley was up in the top of the booth and kind of let Sorensen do his thing on the sideline. And if it doesn't, does that lend a conversation of how much confidence San Francisco has uh, with or, or in Nick Sorensen? Obviously, time will tell. That's only speculation. But as of now, we have no idea where Brandon Staley will be on game day, booth or sideline. Uh, some housekeeping. Uh, Ricky Pearsall. First round pick and sixth round pick, Jarrett Kingston, have yet to sign. They are the only two rookies of the 2024 class that have yet to sign. Now, both those guys practice, but again, have not signed their contracts yet. No reason to worry. Don't be all there like, Pearsall hasn't signed. They'll sign. Like, it makes me laugh when these aggregators, which I am one at times too, are like, this player signed a four-year blank blank contract. That's the only kind of contract they can sign. <laughs> like, all it simply is is working out guarantees and stuff like that. Um, and and so don't don't sweat Pearsall not signing. He's not Crabtree. <laughs> He's not Crabtree. Don't worry about it. Um, so just relax. We'll be okay. <laughs> it's not even OTAs yet. We're good. Um, I do want to clarify some things in regards to how rookie camp happens. I'm someone who, ha who has been to OTAs and, and training camp the last two years, but I had never been to rookie camp outside of last Friday. And it does change how you think of things when it comes to 
practice. They don't utilize the offensive line, and they don't utilize the defensive line. It's simply just quarterback, tight end, running back receivers against safeties, cornerbacks, and linebackers. You're not getting any trench work at all. All those guys are on the sideline or doing drills behind the offense and defense. Like, or on the other field entirely. Like, they're not involved really in the practice outside of individual drills at all. So it, you really have a hard time talking about coverages and, you know, pressure on a quarterback, accurate throws. It's not like in training camp or a preseason game where guys are going out of that times. Like, and even then, in training camp, context matters. And sometimes someone can be standing behind the offense or has a, a different POV at the practice field where they see something different than I would or they would, right? So... Um, that was new to me. That said, you can take literally nothing away from Dominic Pooney, Jared Kingston, uh, or even Evan Anderson. Like, you can't take anything away from those guys other than they're big, they're strong, they move well against a pad. <laughs> so, um, essentially it was like an extended combine for those players. Uh, that said, we did at least hear from... Dominic Pooney after practice and Pooney did say this now is he being truthful who knows maybe he's kind of um kind of <laughs> just this is my quarterback now so I like him but he did say this about Brock Purdy uh, I love Brock Purdy the fact that he was a last pick in the draft to where he is now it's a crazy story I don't think you could write that when the other two quarterbacks went down he came in and won and I said Watch him cook. All that to say, uh, Dominic Pooney is very eager to block for Brock Purdy. Now, Pooney obviously has to earn a starting job, but you can tell. And I think through the one press conference he has had with the media live in person, uh, not via Zoom post his actual draft selection, uh, fans and the team is going to really like Dominic Pooney. I, I think he has a great personality, energetic, He's fun. Uh, he even asked the PR team, can I curse on these things? So uh, I do think they got themselves someone that fits in that locker room. He wants to learn and he understands why he's there because they asked him uh, why the Niners favor athletic offensive linemen like himself, which again, San Francisco drafted two of the five linemen in this class that finished with the top five shuttle time in a top five three cone, so they, they love themselves, the, the athletic offensive linemen, Pooney said they like to go out and run in space, they don't want these 340 pound linemen that can't move, you have athletes on this team all over the field, you have to go block for them and run with them, and we've seen that since Shanahan's gotten here, right, you've seen receivers and tight ends and running backs, even quarterbacks at time, uh, getting downfield, but he very much prioritizes getting, I know people hate this player or dislike him a lot, but McGlinchey as a run blocker would get out there and he'd lead the way. Trent Williams would lead the way. Aaron Banks leads the way. So I think, you know, they got a guy that understands his role and understands why he's on the team. Uh, they also asked him about having a finisher's mentality. Uh, we we've seen Trent Williams just run through the uh, defensive players and shove them to the ground, and we go, that's nastiness. Dominic Pooney understands that you have to have a finisher's mentality on a Niners offensive line, and he said, you have to. The game is won up front. If the receivers and tight ends see you playing soft, it affects them too. We, being the offensive line, set the tone. Physicality hard-nosed football, run the ball. I like to do those things. So you totally understand, at least via, you know, the mouth of Dominic Pooney himself, why the Niners wanted to get him in the building. They simply just said, man, this guy understands what his role is, what we like, and knows what we expect from a player on our offensive line. And again, there wasn't much to take away from that at training camp. They're playing against pads, but I'm very eager to see you know, if that translates from a media press conference to on the field for Dominic Pooney. But other than that, uh, I think fans will love 
at least him is the person. He's fun, energetic, and he looks really excited to play football. And I can't wait to see him put the pads on for the first time in training camp later uh, this, uh, this off-season program because it's going to be fun. Because I, I, I told you before, I can see him being a starter this year, and I, I really believe that if he understands his role off the field, all you got to do is prove it on the field. Now, it's easier said than done, but I do think that Pooney can do that this year uh, for the 49ers. Um, let's dive into some questions before we dive into actually what happened on the practice field. Dumpster Fire Dan, first off, great name. Did Pearsall look as big as he did in the videos? Looks like he added muscle. Um, Pearsall looked bigger than I expected, but to be fair, I have not seen him in person other than last Friday. Um, he's not a big, massive receiver. It's not Jawan Jennings. Um, he's not as big as Brandon Ayuk in regards to the muscle or Debo, obviously. Um, but I will say this, he's much thicker than Danny Gray and Dante Pettis ever were. Um, if, if you have any of those concerns, I don't think you're going to have to worry about his body holding up or if he can hang uh, physically with some of the defensive backs, unless there is a, you know, a bigger bodied one. But I do think that, you know, Pearsall, you know, he, he's not a frail child, <laughs> right? He's not this skinny twig. He has some muscle to him. That I think will allow him to hold up. And then once he gets, you know, a diet plan in an NFL weight room with a, with a nutritionist and a trainer, he'll get bigger and stronger. And I think we will kind of look at him and go, wow, like you put on strength like I did uh, in the first couple of years of his career. Um, Dumpster Fire Dan also says San Francisco added offensive line depth today. Yes, they did. I already talked about that early in the show with... Uh, Chris Hubbard, uh, it makes sense. I like the move. They needed to make the move, so you're right. Um, Nugent could win the center spot per William Roberts. Again, I am not going to sit here and say I have all these amazing takeaways from the offensive line. There just wasn't much to see outside of, that guy's guarding the pad. That guy's holding the pad for the other guy. Um... That said, I am someone who believes San Francisco is in a position where the backup center spot is wide open. Whether it be Nick Zakel, whether it be Ben Barch, who I think took center snaps last year, or even Drake Nugent, who I think, you know, as a UDFA, could he win a spot? Sure, it's not like anyone's tied at the backup center spot on this team. A lot of depth positions are open on this team once you get past pony ain't nobody back there you're like you gotta have him so i don't know if he will but he certainly could win a backup center spot i think brenda is stuck in there as a starter unless things go haywire but i believe that you know your starting five are probably going to be the same coming into the year unless pony just plays out of his mind come training camp uh bobo asks us do you believe we will eventually be a super bowl champ under the kyle shanahan regime I'm not sure. I know it's been heartbreaking. I know fans have been distraught and sad. And, you know, this last February was not fun <laughs> for many of us, including in 2019 as well. So it's been, you know, a rough go about it, despite how much winning we've done. Um, do I think we will eventually win a Super Bowl? Uh, I do. I, I truly do. Now, that is maybe the optimist in me. Because there also is a, a pessimistic side that says it's so hard to get back and we've done it twice and we lost both times. You're just kind of hoping that the next time you go, you don't have to play Mahomes. <laughs> You're like, we'll play anybody else. You give us, you can give us an undefeated Texans, Dolphins, Josh Allen and the Bills, just anybody but Mahomes. Uh, and I think that, you know, it just feels like the Niners have been the most successful team of the last five seasons outside of Kansas City. And it just so happens they've played Kansas City both times. They've probably been the better team in both those games. So, and th this last year was a better example of that as my dog hacks and heaves up behind me. <laughs> so I apologize. Um, off the hamster wheel says this, that, excuse me, uh, that Kyle's running out of excuses this year. I do think that uh, 
Niner fans and the grace Kyle Shanahan has, albeit it's a big, you know, big gap. Uh, I think it is wearing a little thin because once you go twice and you lose twice with many of the same things being the reason you lose, it does just make fans say, we'll never win. This guy can't get over the hump. Um, and I know there's so many Andy Reid comparisons. The last thing you want to be is the team that fires Andy Reid and watches him go get Mahomes. And I think that, you know, I don't think Shanahan's getting fired this year, win or lose, uh, especially lose. I think it would take, you know, a 6-11 season followed by a wild card out, you know, round one. And it's like, oh, crap. You know, you've had two bad seasons in a row. You know, Purdy's getting paid and he's not the guy. Like, a lot of things have to happen for that to occur. But maybe it does. Um, Bobo says, I really want to beat Mahomes to prove that we can. I get that. Uh, I thought this year, this past year, excuse me, was the perfect chance to right the wrong. That was 2019 and 2020. That didn't happen. It hurts. It sucks. It stinks. Yes, I want to beat Mahomes. I, I, I would like to be in, in, be able to beat Goliath one day and knock him off the top. I don't want it to just be the 2020 Buccaneers and Brady. I hate that it was them, if not us. That said, score points in fourth quarters and third quarters and you win those games. <laughs> um, uh, off the hamster wheel says again that uh, Niners have a harder road to get past Lions, Eagles, and Green Bay. Um, yes and no. I, I think that, you know, tomorrow the schedule releases. That said, there'll be a lot of conversations of, you know, strength of schedule and this travel, and we'll obviously dive into that here, but... You don't win, you don't win games in, in May and June and July. You win them once the season begins, um, and I think that while San Francisco has to play, I think they have a strength of schedule somewhere in the middle this year, which is nice. I think they have an average competitor win percentage of like five oh five, so it's you know around five hundred or just over it. That said, um, I think that. Uh, Jared Goff gets hurt this year. Galen Hurts falls apart again. Green Bay loses a star player. Like, it's not as if the Niners are only, you know, the only team that can suffer injuries and bad games and guys get hurt. So, well, yes, San Francisco has to play teams like Philadelphia and Green Bay and Tampa Bay and the Lions and others. It's not like those teams don't also have to play each other in San Francisco uh, and it's not as if those guys won't get banged up, won't get hurt, just like San Francisco could. So we say that and go, they have to play all these tough teams, and I would agree. San Francisco has also been to, what, four NFC championships in five seasons. So it's not like every year there hasn't been. They have to play all these teams and the Rams and the Lions, in which they do. It's not like they haven't found themselves in the upper in the upper echelon for five years now, or four of the five years. So, you're right. Yes, tough teams to play, but it's not like it's impossible. And if anything, they've proven that despite who's put in their way, they usually come out towards the top. Now you hope to be the final guy and top dog, but um, that isn't always done. Uh, let's move into actually what transpired during practice, because that's what I care about. What did these rookies look like? What did Pearsall look like? Mason Pline. What did Garendo look like? Um, now, I'm going to come out and just be totally transparent here. I didn't give two rips about Mitch Davidson and Tanner Mordecai, the quarterbacks. They didn't look good. Mordecai was inaccurate. He has no touch. It was check down Charlie all day long. Now, to be fair, I have no idea what the game plan was, what the coaches wanted to see. All I know was the throws I saw, they were either inaccurate or they were check downs. That's all they were. Nothing excited me. Passes were wobbly. When they weren't wobbly, they were again check downs or inaccurate. Anyone telling you this guy really impressed me at quarterback, th there was not much to see. There's no defensive line. It's everyone's dropping in coverage. <laughs> so you have, I don't know, seven guys in coverage. And you're like, I have no defensive line, no protection. 
there's no like you can't really put guys in motion it's line three guys up three wide four wide and go crazy right so you really can't take away much from the quarterbacks so we're not really going to talk about them my clear takeaways that were just like abundantly clear was Malik Mustafa who already said was a great communicator and looked massive. I mean, this guy looks like he's, you know, just jacked. He was talking, being a leader on the field. Um, Ricky Pearsall and Jacob Cowling were fielding punts during the earlier portions of practice. Jacob Cowling did drop one. <laughs> Pearsall did not. Now, again, Cowling did mention in his post-practice press conference that, you know, he's comfortable back there, but it's it's the first day. Like, how much can you really take away from the first day? These guys have been college football seasons, right into draft preparation, senior bowls, hula bowls, scouting combines, and haven't really played against competition since, I don't know, January. And it's been four months, right? So I would give all these guys some leeway on day one. That doesn't mean there wasn't positives and negatives. Again, Pearsall didn't drop a punt. Cowling did. Now, Cowling bounced back and didn't drop one after that, but it's the first day. The first day of school, you had a whole summer off, and you're like, man, my brain just does not work. I will give everybody that leeway. It's day one. You're getting your feet wet, putting your toes back in the pond for the first time, so let's not go crazy and say, this guy stinks and that guy's great, but there was some positives and some negatives. Um, I think... You know, there was some miscommunication in the coverages, which will hopefully go away once a lot of these guys get the reps in. Also, a ton of tryout players who aren't even going to be on the team at any time this year, right? So it's not like I'm looking at and go, Renardo Green messed up here because blah, blah, blah. Like, no, like people ran into each other, incomplete passes, there were checkdowns. Um, I will say this, though, that... I've already seen complaints that Ricky Pearsall is too busy dancing, not catching the football. Um, just shut up. <laughs> just, just shut up. Like, you can have a little fun. You can dance. They can do their thing like Debo and Ayuk do. Um, I thought Ricky Pearsall looked pretty good in the first day of rookie camp. That said, he should look good. He's a first-round pick amongst UDFAs, mid-round talents, and guys that currently aren't on teams. Um, but there was a play that Tanner Mordecai was the quarterback, and again, I don't know what the play, the, you know, the playbook was and what the plan was for the quarterbacks, but Ricky Pearsall just flat-out had three, four yards of separation on Renardo Green. Green put the hands up, Pearsall smacked him away, and it was just off to the races, gone. Mordecai didn't even throw him the football. And I was like, man, like, that's first round, you know, first overall, first round pick, excuse me, against second round pick, and Pearsall just smacked the hands away like they were nothing and beat Green downfield and was wide open. That's a play where Purdy, if it's an actual game, looks Pearsall's way and probably hits him for a touchdown or at least a big shot downfield. So there was some good seen from Pearsall beating Green, who's really good in press man coverage and is hoping to be a starter this year at a certain point uh, for San Francisco. So I think that's a great rep from Pearsall to simply, here's a go out, be your guy. He did that. On the inverse, Green showed that he needs to be a little more physical at the line. But again, it's rookie camp. They probably told him, don't go nuts, no tackling, no one gets hurt. You never want to hear, someone broke a finger, someone tore an ACL in rookie camp. Well, now you're useless. <laughs> so I don't know what what exactly, you know, the, the speech was to the players before practice. But Pearsall, on that one rep, did beat Green downfield pretty badly. Um, and then later, sticking with Pearsall, uh, Mordecai threw behind Pearsall, had bad timing. Um, Pearsall was like, what, like, what are you doing? Um, and then there was another play. I think it was Mordecai as well. On the left sideline, he had Pearsall wide open downfield. And Pearsall was like streaking down, you know, the seam. And Mordecai just overshoots him, has no touch on the football. 
And it's like, man, like that's a free touchdown there too. So Pearsall was exhibiting why he was a first round pick uh, this past year's draft, simply because he was outshining many people, but the person relaying him the ball was not doing their job. Now, there was a play that happened later that Pearsall couldn't get a couldn't get a clean release. The defensive back jammed him. Uh, the quarterback, Mitch Davidson, missed him high, and he was early with the football, and you know, Pearsall said, I ain't even trying for it. So there was some good. Had a few deep shots downfield that should have been taken or hit accurately. Would have been big plays for Pearsall, and with Purdy and Joshua Dobbs and Brandon Allen, you'd like to think those shots are hit or at least attempted, uh, and Pearsall looks better for it. So I don't think there was too much to glean from you know, of like, Pearsall was bad. He looks smooth. The route running is there. He's quick. Um, does he have long speed? Long enough to beat UDFAs <laughs> and a bunch of mid-round picks. So uh, I think the excitement level should be there for a player like Pearsall. Uh, even after one day of practice, and I'm sure fans, once you can go to the, the practices, you'll see it. He may not be great day one or even day 10, but you will see as to why he was a first-round pick. Um, let's move to the running backs, because um, the running backs were off kind of caddy corner from the, where the media stood, kind of in the back corner, so they were kind of hard to see, but um, Cody Schrader was out there, Isaac Grendo was out there. Um, I think they both dropped passes out of the backfield, but I think Grendo looked far better than Schrader, as he should. But I will say this, for all the talk of Grendo testing well, the 4-3 speed, um, he's a very quick cutter, and he gets upfield really quick. Um, again, he does take a little bit you know, to get those legs going, but as a pass catcher, very much catch, one cut, and then he's moving, right? So um, you can see the short yard explosiveness to get him upfield faster that can kind of get him away from a tackler or defender and kind of buy him, you know, three, four, five extra yards that can give you a first down or help the team. So um, that was definitely on display in rookie camp. You can see the, the quick yardage explosiveness and why he tested so well. Now, they weren't handing the ball off in the backfield. We didn't see them as runners. So we only saw Grendo and Schrader as pass catchers. Um, again, I, I think they both dropped passes out of the backfield, but overall, I think Grendo did have stronger hands, looked much smoother, kind of shifting from pass catcher to a runner, and I think that is a an aspect of his game San Francisco will utilize uh, during preseason and once the regular season begins, and could also separate him from Mitchell and Mason if all things go well. Um, Jacob Cowling did absolutely nothing. Uh, he didn't catch a ball. I didn't see him open very much. Um, now, again, there are certain plays you focus on a player and you just miss things, so I'm not going to say I know it all. Uh, I just think Cowing, you muff a punt early and then you don't do anything in practice that shows off your skills. Now, again, I am someone that has said in the pre-draft process, not knowing who they were going to draft, that Jacob Cowing likely isn't going to impress in training camp and in practice simply because that he works and can be utilized in motion much better than lining him out, you know, in the slot or outside. Like, you put him in motion as a gadget player, you're going to see Cowing's strengths start to kind of be on display. So um, I wouldn't take too much from that. If someone tells you he struggled, yeah, it wasn't a great day. But I do think that what Cowling's good at, they weren't really doing in camp. Um, that said, I do think, you know, once you get him out there with Debo and Ayuk and, and Kittle and, and Juwan Jennings and, and Danny Gray and Chris Conley and the rest of the guys, you'll start to see what he can actually do. But uh, I was someone who thought Cowling made sense with the Dolphins because they love to use motion. They got Taj Washington and Malik Washington from Virginia and USC, but I can see Cowan kind of being that guy for San Francisco is where, oh, he's lined out in the slot. Eh, he's fine. But on end arounds and sweeps and all these things Shanahan likes to do on the backfield and getting him free releases, that's where Cowan kind of comes to life. Whereas in rookie camp day one, 
You're not doing any of that stuff because why would you? So uh, I'm not going to not cowing at all. He, he was fine. Um, and I think we will see more of his skills on display once actual practices start and in preseason starts. Um, Mason Pline, who uh, 49ers 209 Aspa earlier, he didn't do much. He, 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 he's massive. He, he's a massive man. Um, and I think that, you know, he is someone that doesn't have a great anchor. He needs to build up his strength. He doesn't move very well. He's not clunky, but he's not a very smooth runner. That said, it was a lot of check downs underneath stuff. It wasn't, get me over the middle, get me a post route. I think the longest catch may have been to Tay Martin. Maybe it was Pearsall. Um, no, excuse me. It was a ball thrown by Mitch Davidson to Monroe Young down the left side line on a post route that just wobbled its way all the way to him. And I was like, what the heck was that thing? Um, that's what you're dealing with in rookie camp. It's a bunch of people that don't have jobs for a reason, albeit better than myself. <laughs> so, um, I don't think Pline did anything that was like, oh, like it was much more of blocking drills and you know much more of check downs he has good hands like I, I don't think it's I don't think his hands are an issue like in my notes I see him having let's see uh I think I have him one catch and that's kind of all he was targeted so like it doesn't really like there wasn't much to take away from him uh, on defense though Tata Bethune is a massive human yeah, that that that's a big boy <laughs> um and I think that he will I think he'll make the roster. I think he's already better than D. Winters and um, I'm forgetting his name for whatever reason, Jalen Graham. I think what he brings in coverage, I think there's more consistency in his game where the ceiling isn't very high like D. Winters, but the fit, the physicality, fits what San Francisco likes a lot more than Jalen Graham. Well, I think both those guys can be good, mind you. I just think that... but. Bethune just fits that. If he has to play this year, I think he'd be more consistent than what Winters and Graham showed last season. But we'll obviously get an update once OTAs and minicamp come along, in which Nick Sorensen did mention D. Winters, Jalen Graham, and Devondre Campbell as potential you know, third linebackers, second linebackers once Greenlock comes back or to start in place of him if he's off the field. Um, but I do think that overall... If I had to, which I hate doing this, but I'll do it for the sake of doing it. If I had to say of the draft class, the best player, probably Pearsall or Garendo. The worst one was Renardo Green, but other than like he had one, maybe two bad plays. Um, Tariq Owens did beat Green on a slant over the middle. So I know there was that video that I put out of his scouting report and it was a really bad route and everyone's kind of clowning him for it. He runs much smoother than that in person. Uh, so um, I know that video was a pro day at Levi's. I can see why San Francisco, outside of that one bad route he ran at the pro day, I can see why they did sign him. There is something there. And he runs just like his dad. The hands, the way they move kind of like this when he's running routes, it looks just like Terrell. Now, will he be that good? Probably not. Terrell's a Hall of Famer, but... Tariq did beat a second round pick. Uh, so, you know, I, I think there is some upside there that could take a little bit. He's an older prospect, but I think it could take a, you know, a year or two, get his feet wet. But he also could be a player that once he plays against, you know, Lenore and Yadim and Rakisin and other veterans on the team uh, on, on the outside, that he could actually surprise us. So time will tell with these guys. It's one day. Um, I don't think there's any judgments judgments you can truly make. I think it was much more of an informational day for me, uh, learning about Dominic Pooney and Bethune and Jacob Cowling and hearing Nick Sorensen talk and kind of learning what things will look like on day one of OTAs and training camp this week and next month. So there wasn't too much, but I do think the excitement level is there. I can't wait to see Pearsall and Cowling and this draft class come together and I think if Garendo can stay healthy, my 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 wild take of the draft was Garendo is the best outside zone runner of the entire draft class. And I do think that, you know, 
I think fans will see the explosiveness, and I think there will be a lot of talk of whether it happens or not, that why isn't this guy playing? And I think that will be a conversation that Grendo should play over Mitchell and Mason. He He's very, very explosive. And if he can stay healthy and get his legs right and stay on the field, I think there will be a, a, a role for him, at least as a pass catcher in the offense, because the hands are there. The ability to go from a, a catcher to a runner is already there. And I think there isn't much... Like, Grendo doesn't have many reps, so there is this kind of untapped, unknown potential with him that I think Shanahan is really intrigued with. Uh, so I can see them, you know, kind of wanting to give it time to kind of know who he is, but I can also see them being like, we need this guy on the field now, so time will tell. But thank you so much for watching and listening. Again, I apologize for the, the bare bones uh, backdrop I'm moving. I'll be in Southern California this Friday and hopefully get the studio all set up for everything. Uh, but we will react to the NFL schedule tomorrow night, 5 p.m. Niners already playing the Jets at Levi's. ESPN Monday Night Football, September 9th. I think at 5.20 or 5 o'clock p.m. West Coast time. You can follow us on social media at 49ers underscore access is the X or Twitter. 49ers dot access is the Instagram. And if you want to go to any Niner game this year, if you want to go to the season and home opener against the Jets, tickets are already on sale. Use our promo code 49ers access 49 ERS ACC ESS at SeatGeek.com and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. Football is almost back. Almost here. OTAs are very soon coming up really quick and training camp begins sooner than you can expect. If you want to go to any event, use that promo code and save yourself $20 off your first purchase. My name is Sterling Bennett saying thank you for watching, listening, liking, sharing, and subscribing. And until next time, stay faithful.